Hi, I'm David. Uh, I am, uh, uh, I've been programming since I was 13. I've been designing since I was 20. So that's about 12 years ago. And I founded three companies. Um, and uh, I'm here to teach you a lot about everything, to teach you some things that I know about products, how to build products, how to build an MVP. Who here is on their first startup? Please raise your hands. Okay, who's on their second startup? Nice. Okay, cool. Um, this is me on Twitter, in case you feel like following me. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a very brief uh, introduction of my history. Um, I founded three companies. The first company, Blue Bamboo, uh, was one of the first companies in the world to develop apps as a service to other companies. I founded it in 2008, before uh, the App Store was released. Uh, there was uh, 10 people in the team at maximum. The second company is a marketplace, a mobile marketplace in, for the neighborhood. It allows neighbors to sell stuff like couches to each other. Uh, I launched it like a year and a half ago. Um, until now, about 100,000 things were put up for sale for a value of about $30 million. I need to use this. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay. That does sound better. <laughs> Are we good? Okay. Um, and the third company, I'm going to show you a brief video of right now. It's called Mixtiles. Um, here's a video. All right, sorry. Sorry, so this is a company to get photos from your phone to your wall, to your wall and hang them easily. So check it out. Pick your photos. You send them in. Get a package and then you just put them up. Like that. Okay, so I'm gonna sh tell you more about all of these in a bit, um, but now I'm gonna get right down to what I actually want to talk to you about, which is building minimum viable products and the fact that startups are risky. Now, um, if you're on your second startup or even if you're first, you probably know at this point that startups are hard. <laughs> um, a lot of them don't work out for all kinds of reasons. And I think that the fact that startups are risky is one of the most underappreciated facts of startups. Uh, a lot of people get into it with great intentions and a lot of confidence and they uh, don't appreciate enough uh, how dangerous, you know, quote unquote, it actually is. Um, one of my goals is to raise awareness, show you that it's risky, then show you some tools for how to deal with that. And uh, I just want to, sort of as a reference point, uh, I want to tell you that there have been other industries in the history of, you know, of, uh, of uh, humanity which uh, deal with very risky domains. So for example, banking deals with a lot of risk, insurance, and uh, in these domains, uh, tools were developed to deal with risk, uh, and these tools were successfully deployed to create great value. Now, I think that uh, something similar can be said about startups. I think, in fact, something similar needs to be said about startups. It's risky. We need tools to, you know, to deal with it. And um, I'm going to show you some of them and talk about some of them. So um, I start by looking at a startup as sort of uh, a theory about the world. Or better said, maybe it's a few theories. The first theory is that you can build whatever you think you can build. Uh, the second theory is that whatever you're building has a market. And the third is that you can reach that market. Now, all these three things are separate uh, domains of business. You know, they can all fail. And if, if any one of them fails, the whole company fails. So they all need to work. Um, if you have an engineering team, which I hope you do, then the first part is relatively safe. Uh, although you would be surprised how many startups even fail to launch a product, it does happen. Um, but the second and the third part uh, is where most of the risk is. So most startups that fail, fail because they don't manage to, um, to market it. And one of the problems with the second and third parts are that you never really know on which one you failed. So if you, don't, if, you, if you fail to market your product, you never really know it's because, is it because there is no market or is it because you couldn't identify and, and reach the market? It's unclear. You just know that you failed to market. Um, so I wanna, I wanna go ahead and show you some sources of, of risk, basically demonstrate, give you a couple of evidence lines, um, just you know, talking about uh, the fact that startups are risky. 
I'm going to talk about three different sources. The first is venture capital data. Uh, venture capital funds invest uh, in a lot of startups, and once in a while uh, they do us a favor of publishing uh, some data about how they're performing. Um, and it's interesting because you know, they see a lot of startups and it sort of lets you see the bigger picture with some data. Now one of my favorite uh, venture capitalists is a guy called Peter Thiel. He was uh, the co-founder of PayPal and he was also one of the first investors in Facebook. And today he manages a large fund. Now um, about a year ago he did a course at Stanford called CS183 Startup, which I really recommend that all of you read. Uh, you should Google it, like Thiel Stanford or something like that. Uh, it's a brilliant course uh, covering a lot of things about startups and um, specifically one of the things that are relevant to my talk today is this graph which he showed um, how the portfolio basically performs. So they, this is one portfolio of the fund, so one investment in 20 companies and how much money each company returned to the fund. Now, if you look at this graph, I did some work to kind of clarify it a little bit, but you see that out of 20 companies, about 15 uh, had a negative return for the fund, so they returned under 1x what was invested in them. About three roughly broke even, so you know, sort of uh, about what was invested in them, and then about two were uh, successful. Now, um, if you've raised money before, then you probably know that in cases where uh, there's a rough break even, so in cases where there is not a high return, Usually, uh, contracts with venture capital or in investors include something called liquidity preferences, which means that generally investors will get their money out first before founders do. Uh, and what that means is that in the cases of the rough break even, usually the founders don't see much. So I actually know a few friends of mine who sold companies, uh, uh, which what seemed on paper pretty good deals, maybe even for millions of dollars, but uh, because of these liquidity preferences, they don't actually see that much money in the end. Um, so. At least financially, if you look at this portfolio, and I'm, I'm not saying that financial uh, um, you know, data is the only metric of success, it certainly isn't, but it's not a bad way to, to assess uh, you know, the success of a startup. So at least financially, in this portfolio, uh, 18 companies uh, failed, uh, I would estimate, to generate any significant uh, returns for their founders, and two did, which is about 90% of, of uh, you know, not great. Um, one thing that's probably important to say is that this is not specific data to Teal's fund. Uh, a lot of venture capitalists talk about these things, the, a lot of them publish data, and uh, this is pretty much confirmed by all VCs who talk publicly about their work. Uh, they often use words like power laws, exponential returns of startups. Um, it's sort of an accepted, um, at this point, an accepted uh, knowledge you know, about the industry that this is what VC returns look like. And also remember <laughs> that uh, this, this is data that shows one of the best investors in the world investing in what are probably some of the best startups in the world. Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, one thing I forgot to say is uh, if you have any questions at all while I'm speaking, just raise your hand. Uh, it's totally cool. It's a, it's a conversation. So if you want to ask anything, just raise your hand. Um, the second thing I want to, you know, so this is some data. So the second thing I want to do is just tell you some stories, like anecdotes, uh, three stories that, that I like, which uh, I think are representative. The first is uh, uh, Steve Jobs, who's you know one of the famous, so sort of you know the the standard uh, successful entrepreneur. <laughs> um, and when, if you get down to it, they actually actually had a lot of failures in his past, a lot of things which didn't work out. Uh, maybe some of you don't even know many of these things that are that are on the on the board here. Who knows Ping, for example? Okay, one person, two people. Okay, uh, so it was a social network for music. Um, and all of these things, you know, you remember that all of these things had brilliant people working on it, high budgets, you know, it's a, you know, one of the best executing teams in the world, of course, uh, and still, uh, you know, pre pretty much a straight out failure. Another story which I like uh, is an Israeli entrepreneur who's uh, pretty well known. His name is Dov Moran. He invented the disc on key. So, you know, if you have like one of these USB sticks in your pocket where, uh, you know, like a disc on key, so this company invented it and they sold it to M Systems for $1.6 billion, which is a great success story for, you know, especially in Israel. And then the second company uh, that he founded um, actually raised one of the largest seed rounds in the history of, of venture capital, something like $120 million before doing anything. Um, and their concept was basically uh, modularizing mobile phones. So you kind of, you had like a core small phone that you can put in different jacket phones uh, to adapt them to different use cases. And they released this like a, a little bit before the iPhone came out and uh, didn't really work out that well. 
and uh, then they closed and you know they in the end they sold I think their remaining patents and assets for maybe a million or two dollars uh, so pretty essentially you know they, they never reached any traction and almost the whole investment round was lost Another pretty famous story is Instagram. Uh, you probably, a lot of you probably use Instagram. Uh, what you may not know is that uh, before Instagram, the same team had another product called Bourbon, which was uh, also a social network, uh, which had more kinds of things, not only photos. And they built this product, and it didn't go that well. Uh, and then at some point, they decided to kill it and build Instagram. And that, of course, went pretty well, as you know. Um, so these are, you know, these are just three stories that, that I like. Uh, but I, you know, I could have done 30 of these stories. Uh, you know, we have limited time, so I only did three. But uh, I can tell you that it's sort of a hobby of mine to follow the, uh, the history of successful products and the people behind them. And almost anywhere you care to look, uh, whenever there is a successful product, there is usually years of, uh, of uh, you know, trying a thing, something's working, something's don't working. It's usually sort of the standard uh, story of any successful entrepreneur. Um, one of the problems is uh, that you know, even if you do try to find the failures, that it's usually only easy to find the high-profile failures. Uh, so most things fail quietly in the lab, you know, like some company works for a few months on something or half a year, they put together something, they show it to a few people, and nobody likes it sort of, they can it, or they don't actually ever market it you know, to a very wide audience, so it's sort of hard to even know. So actually the amount of failures is even higher than, uh, than what you would find, even if you did try to find it. And I thought it would be interesting um, to look at my own experience, because I have all the data, right? So like, it's hard for me to, to, uh, to, to see everybody's uh, information, but I can, I can see my own record. Um, so I asked myself, you know, when I, when, I, when I planned this talk, like, what does my own record look like in terms of failures and successes? Now, on paper, it looks pretty good. Um, I built three companies. Uh, all of them are, you know, they have traction and are running and profitable. Some of them and the others are, are doing well. And one startup, which I'm going to tell you about in a bit, was a failure. Um, you know, I do a lot of talks about products, and I'm working with Google to help. This. So, like, on paper, it looks like I'm doing a lot of things uh, pretty well. But uh, I can tell you that uh, w when I look at my own record, there's a lot of failures uh, of things that I did. So I'm, I'm going to give you a few examples. So these are four companies where I was the founder, which completely failed. And almost nobody knows them, because uh, I did them before um, I had more exposure. You know, I mean, like, you know, I, I did it when I was just starting out. Um, and uh, yeah, they weren't really marketed that well and they just completely failed. Uh, but that's not really the end of the story. There's like at least another five projects uh, where I wasn't the founder, but I was you know, what you would call like the CEO of the product. So I completely managed these products. So their failure is totally my responsibility. Um, but that's not really the end of it either. You know, there's at least another uh, you know, six or seven or eight projects where uh, maybe I wasn't the CEO of the product, but I had some lead management role, you know, so maybe I was the CTO or the lead designer or the lead product person or something like that. Uh, so definitely also a large part of the um, failure also lies on my, on my shoulders. Um, and all these things were, they were things with high budgets, you know, like probably the combined budget of all these projects is millions of dollars. Um, great people working on them. Um, you know, especially on the right side, the left side, I don't know, it's just me. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I'll give you one example. For example, MasterChef. Do you know MasterChef, the TV show? So uh, uh, I worked with MasterChef to um, build apps uh, for their show in many countries. And they were, they were launched with big marketing budgets and incredibly well-produced videos of people cooking. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars invested just in content production, just in filming really good videos. And it completely failed. This was a project that I did with News Corp, you know, one of the largest companies in the world. Um, and after that, they decided to not do apps anymore, <laughs> you know, stick with television. Um, another funny story is a, a startup called Haidu. I, I, I like it as an example because um, it's, um, it's a good example of a kind of failure that happens often in startups. So this, this is a startup that was done by one of the most influential wine journalists in the world, somebody who writes a lot about wine, you know, like in a lot of magazines and uh, is really an insider of the wine world. And he tried to build a platform which solves all the problems of the wine industry uh, in one platform. So it was a really elaborate, you know, sort of, I would say convoluted product even with uh, social elements and blogs and e-commerce and mini sites for wineries and, and, you know, a lot of things. And what happened to them is what happens to a lot of companies that do too many things, is that they spend almost all their money on development, and then they sort of try to go out to the market, they, they sort of, you know, have like a few months to try something, it doesn't work, and then they close because they ran out of money. 
Um, so those are, you know, a few more stories. So what am I actually telling you? Uh, am I telling you that startups are just luck? Well, no. <laughs> you know, if, uh, if I was going to say that, then I probably wouldn't be here and you probably wouldn't be here. But what I am saying is that the world is a complicated place. Uh, startups are multivariate, multidimensional problems. Uh, they're very hard, you know, a lot of aspects of them are very hard to predict. And we're just not that smart, really. Uh, you know, a lot of us uh, have, we are overconfident uh, about our startups and we don't understand that they're risky. Um, I want to tell you my, my experience. Um, so I, I speak to about 100 startups a year. And let's say over the last three years, I spoke to maybe three, 400 startups. And I'm going to tell you what uh, sort of the average trajectory <laughs> of a startup looks like, at least from what I saw. So um, it's usually two or three people. They have an idea and they get together. And they think their idea is great. And uh, then they spend maybe four or five, six months building a product. And then they launch it, they put like posts on their Facebook feed like, yay, we launched our product and you know, and it's cool. Uh, and like they try to get people to use it and then sort of nobody cares. Like that's sort of what happens. Like a few people reach the website and like, eh, you know, sort of, and, and nothing really happens. So the, the, what the startup tried to achieve doesn't happen. And then they go back to the drawing board. They say, okay, what did we do wrong? You know, they, they, uh, they, they go through some replanning process. Uh, they, they, they remove some features, they add some features. They spend another few months um, on an iteration and then they release it again. And they again try to do some marketing push and again, nothing happens. Um, then they do one more, but another three months, same story, nothing happens, then they close. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's like it's morbid, but you know, that's, that's sort of the, the average story. Um, <laughs> now, so what, so what are solutions, like how, how does one deal with this? So a lot of people are talking about how to deal with startup risk. So if, for example, some partial solutions which get talked about often are, uh, you know, one is picking familiar markets, it's sort of the scratch your own itch problem, solve your own problems sort of method. Um, a lot of people talk about only working with great people. That's, you know, a way to, to reduce risk. Uh, some people talk about diversification, um, a little bit less popular, but some people do talk about it, including myself. <laughs> um, now, of course, all of these things uh, also have downsides. So, for example, if you pick familiar markets, you have less options, you know, because you can only attack markets that you know well. Acquiring talent, you know, anybody who's ever tried to hire top talent knows that it's rare and expensive. Diversification costs focus. Uh, now, all of these things are great tools, which I think, you know, you should read about and, you know, so every one of them deserves a talk. Uh, I don't have, I, my talk is going to be about something else called running experiments, lean startups, MVPs. Um, but by all means, you know, do try to read more about these other things and, uh, and you know, educate yourself. But I'm going to be talking about running experiments. Um, so everybody today almost everybody who does startups has heard, has heard of minimum viable products. Like, who here has heard of minimum viable products? Like, raise your hand. Okay, actually not that many people, interesting. Um, so a, minim a minimum viable product is uh, a, a standard best practice of startups today, where people try to build smaller products, you know, launch them faster, and I'm gonna be talking about what that means for a second, uh, like in a bit. But um, interestingly, or perhaps, you know, uh, regrettably, a lot of startups fail to execute the strategy well, and uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about starting an experiment instead of starting a business. I think a lot of, pro a lot of the problem reduces to, you know, what I told you before about the story. People get, you know, get together and they have an idea and then they work on it for six months and then it doesn't work. So that's, you know, sort of the problem that I I'm going to talk about, how to not do that. And the way that you don't do that is you run an experiment and not a business. Um, what is an experiment? Maybe, okay, I'll start. What is not an experiment? So how does it usually look like? You have an idea, you sit for six months, and you release something which sort of captures, you know, a, a lot of the idea. Not everything, of course, you know, you leave some things for later, but you sort of attack the problem in a reasonable way. That's the natural inclination of most entrepreneurs. An experiment looks more like this, a lot smaller. I would say probably that the difference is that a business uh, assumes that the market exists. An experiment is designed to examine the market. An experiment is not designed to make money. It's not designed to acquire users. It's not designed to uh, uh, get on the front page of the New York Times or anything else that you might want to do as a startup. It has a very simple goal of examining if the market is out there, if you can reach it, if you can fulfill, if you can create something that people want. Because I can tell you that the, the main reason that startups fail is that they build something that nobody wants. 
Um, so uh, if, if you, you can check for that you know, faster, that would be a great thing. And it turns out that you can in many cases. So how do you do this? Um, how do you build a minimum viable product? So um, usually you want to build something that takes uh, not a lot of resources. You want it to be very, you want it to have a small footprint. You want it to cost less money in less time with less people and less complexity. And I want to talk to you about um, how I think about products. Uh, at least I'll, t I'll, sh I'll show you how I do it and uh, maybe it'll be useful to you. Um, and then I'll give you some examples. So how do I think about products? Um, what I try to do is when I, when I build a product, I try to divide it into functional units, sort of modules, features, whatever, you know, whatever I want to build in this product. And then I ask myself a pretty simple question. If I took any of these features out, uh, how, how big would the damage be, sort of? Um, I'll give you an example, like uh, um, a browser, okay? But it has a bunch of uh, modules. There's a browsing window, there's a bookmarking tool maybe, there's a search tool maybe, um, incognito mode, tabs, whatever, all these things that browsers made of. And you can, you can try to imagine that you, know, you take one of these things and rip them out of the browser and then you ask yourself, how, you know, how bad is this for the browser? And uh, if you do this, you sort of find out that some things are, are things that you really need. So if you sort of take them out, then uh, it kill, pretty much kills the product. And some things, if you take them out, are like, oh, they're sort of nice to have, doesn't really matter, it doesn't really do, you know, not a big deal. So for the browser, you know, I don't know, maybe the browsing window, of course you need that. If you don't have that, you don't have a browser. Uh, search box maybe is pretty important, people are used to it, you know, and then you have all these features um, all the way down to, you know, something called share URL. Uh, is, does anybody use the share URL feature in their browser here? Nobody, okay, okay one person, nice. Um, uh, every modern browser has this feature. You basically, you go to file, share URL, and it opens uh, an email with the URL of your current window, paste it into the email. Every browser has it. Um, now, of course, if you were launching a new browser without this feature, it wouldn't be a big deal, obviously, because nobody cares. Um, another thing that people often have to say about MVPs is that they, they worry that it's bad quality. So, so they'll look at, you know, this, for example, this, this prototype and say, it's, oh, it's so bad, the corners are peeling, or, you know, I can't, I can't, this is not the product that I want to build. And I think this is usually a symptom of people just not understanding well the kind of value that they're creating. You know, if your goal is to build a company that gets photos from your phone to your wall in an easy way that's cheap or whatever, then you don't, like, you know, if you do that well and people want that, then it's going to be fine. Um, and if, you, if people don't want that, it doesn't matter how well you do it, how awesome the finishing is going to be, you know, like, n nobody's going to buy it. Because there is, you know, photo printing is an ultra-crowded space. You know, there's hundreds of companies, large companies, you know, where you can get super finished, you know, like framed, mounted, like, you know, to the last millimeter, like, amazing stuff. Okay, so you got to know what you're competing on. It's very important. Like, don't make the mistake of, of thinking that you're competing on everything. The goal is to, you know, define your value proposition, something that you think is unique and that people need, and then you just do that. And if you don't think that's enough, like, if you look at your value proposition and say, well, that's not enough, you know, I really need these tiles to look better, then you have a, you have a strategic problem. Like it's not, you know, like it's, it's a symptom of some deeper strategic problem that, you know, either you're not convinced that your, your, your value position is valuable enough or something else, I don't know. Um, at this point, I've seen many startups do these things. Uh, when the value is right, when, people, when you're do, helping people do something that they want, other things don't matter. More examples coming up. So, um, the third startup, which is an Israeli startup, I'm sorry, the logo's in Hebrew, sorry. Um, is, a, is a marketplace for the neighborhood. So it's, it's a way to, you know, here's some screenshots. I wanted to show it to you, but it only works in Israel. So if I would show it, you would see nothing because, you know, nobody's using it here. Uh, although I do have like a, a dashboard of analytics and I see where people open it and every, like every week a few people from Israel travel abroad and they sort of open it to see if something is there and then they get disappointed. But usually there's, there's nothing. So you can see you have like a feed of, of stuff, you know, that's for sale in your neighborhood and then you have like a, de you can click it and see sort of the details and you know, give the person a call or something like that. Now, uh, I launched this like a year and a half ago. There's 100,000 things for sale. Uh, the value of all goods is something like $30 million. Um, and it's doing pretty well. Uh, in fact, it, it did so well that the largest uh, uh, company in Israel doing classified ads launched a clone of, 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 this, uh, of this app. So they copied it because they're, they're starting to get worried, which is an interesting story all to itself. Um, now, 
this app had a lot of really bad problems in the beginning. I'm gonna tell you some of them. The MVP was really minimal. Basically, this was the MVP, okay? It had like two screens and a way to publish something, like take a photo. Mm. Uh, it was, yeah, it was like two, two, two or three screens. Today, it's a very like, fully featured. It has like search and categories and it's super sophisticated and you know, like uh, super scalable. <laughs> but today, uh, like back then, it did almost nothing. Um, now, critical issues at launch of this product. So first of all, the loading was really slow. Like at times it took like six, seven, eight, nine seconds to show you anything. Um, another interesting issue was that the location never updated. Sort of you open it once like in Sao Paulo and then it, like, it thought you were always like in that neighborhood no matter where you, where you went later. But the, 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 the really bad problem was the sort order. And this is an interesting story. So uh, when I designed this product, um, I told myself, well, it's a, it's a marketplace for buying stuff from your neighbors. I'm going to sort it so that the closest things um, to you are first in the list. Uh, and that turned out to be a terrible mistake. Anybody want to guess why? Any ideas? About this? Like, I'm telling you, this completely breaks the product. Like, it makes it useless. It's, it's really not intuitive. Like, I, I certainly didn't figure it out in the beginning. Yes, exactly. That's it. So, so the problem is that um, the things that are close to you, they stay close to you. Okay. So if my neighbor puts up a couch and, he's li and he lives next to me, then the couch is going to be next to me tomorrow and a week from now and a month from now until it's sold. And the problem is that you, know, you just open it every time and you see the same things. It doesn't matter how much activity there is in the app. You know, like people could be uploading hundreds of thousands of things for sale, but you're just going to see the same thing day after day. And of course, this completely breaks the product. You're just going to stop using it after like three times because uh, you don't see anything new. And uh, like I noticed this by just you know, using the product myself. You know, like I opened it, like it launched, and, you know, and then uh, I used it the next day. And the next day I was like, what the hell is going on? You know, I'm just seeing the same things. And then I sort of figured it out. I, I got it. <laughs> and, uh, and then I designed a better system, which is basically the way that it needs to work, is you define like a neighborhood size, and then you sort by date you know, within the neighborhood. And then you see the new things in the neighborhood. Um, Okay, <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> okay. Um, what else did this thing not have? Many, many things uh, in the beginning, the MVP. Oh, and I got, before I like, all these issues were happening while the app was getting thousands of shares on Facebook and uh, like 100,000 downloads in the first few weeks, you know, sort of uh, while all this stuff was going on. Uh, except for the sort order breaking the experience, which I fixed really, fixed really fast <laughs> once, I, uh, once I realized it. Um, what else couldn't you do? You couldn't edit items. Like if you sold something, then you, you couldn't change anything about it. If you wanted to like change the price or something, you had to delete it and post something new. Um, you couldn't search. Uh, it didn't support iOS 5, which was like a, you know, a large percent of the market at the time. Um, couldn't access that photos from the, from the album. There was no filtering or no starring or you, know, uh, you couldn't see other areas. There were no categories. And uh, so one of the things that I did in this app is uh, there was a way to send me an SMS personally, like from the about screen. It was like, do you have any questions? Like, send me an SMS. You know, I'm David. You know, like, uh, uh, and uh, over like these, you know, when, when the app really started growing fast, uh, I got thousands of messages from people complaining about all these things in a major way. Everybody was like, why can't I do like all of these things? You know, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was like, uh, that's cool. You know, people like like if people do this, they like the product. <laughs> they don't you know, don't worry about that. Um, also interesting, like just you know, a random story is that a lot of these things, um, a lot of these complaints, uh, some of them actually ended up in the product. So some, you know, some of them the product matured and it added these things, and some it didn't. You know, and and it's, your users will never be able to completely drive the product roadmap. You know, it's, it's your job to sort of see uh, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I'll give you one interesting example. For example, probably out of these thousands of messages, like at least 60% of them complained about not being able to see other areas. They're like, I love seeing my neighborhood, but why can't I see, you know, some other neighborhood? And um, when, I, when I got these, you know, pieces of feedback, uh, I sort of thought about it and um, I concluded that it's not like a genuine problem. Like I, I thought that the real problem is that people don't have enough content. Like it was a new thing. There weren't that many things for sale. So I thought, okay, people, they scroll, they see 10 things, they like it. They get, they get to the end. They're like, oh, I want more. And then sort of the first thing that comes to their mind is why can't I see other areas? Um, but my intuition was that once there would be more content, uh, that people wouldn't care about this anymore and it wouldn't actually be a problem. And it turned out to be right. So once there was more content, uh, nobody complained about this stuff. 
So um, all these problems, it was okay. Like uh, the product worked um, and uh, today it has quite a lot of traction. And, um, you know, again, like one of the important things here is that at the time there was a lot of listing products, uh, you know, that were competing with, you know, a lot of websites where you could put stuff for sale and which had all of these features, you know, and more and crazy filters. And, you know, you could say, I want a car with this engine and this year and this model and like, you know, crazy filtering. I'm like, I'm sure you have here too. Um, and a lot of people would see, you know, would see this MVP and they, would, and they might say, yeah, but like, how are you going to compete with them? They have so many things. So again, you got to remember the, the specific value proposition. The reason this company was founded is to allow people to trade in a neighborhood. Okay. Uh, see if you like sort of, this is like the, the heart of the product. Okay. Uh, see things that people in your neighborhood are selling and sell something in your neighborhood. And like almost any startup, it was going to live and die by if, this works or not, okay? So if people want to trade with their neighbors and they like this experience, then it would be fine and they wouldn't, like, they would complain about the rest of the things, <laughs> but they would still use it. And if they didn't want to do this, then it, didn't ma then it wouldn't have mattered how many of these things that we did in the beginning. They wouldn't have used it because, you know, the other competitors were much better at everything else. You know, they, we, 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 I couldn't compete with the large websites in their field. So again, you know, this, this conception that, um, that MVPs are bad quality or, you know, sort of they don't have the features that's sort of bad, it's just, it's not the right way to look at it. You know, the, the real question is, does it deliver the value that your company wants to create? Uh, and if it does, then it's probably okay. If it doesn't, then it's probably not okay. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm, I'm going to summarize. Uh, basically, startups, theory about the world building kind of safe marketing not that safe um, solutions one solution is to run minimal products that's what i tried to show you the way to do it and this is really what i tried to show you in these examples is you know sort of taking out a lot of stuff that if you don't really think about it hard you might think is really really important but the mechanics of startup work in a way that often they're just not that important you, do, you know you do something small and if it hits the right value proposition then it'll be fine uh, and if it doesn't then it doesn't matter how much other stuff you would do. It wouldn't be fine. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody building MVPs want to ask something about your MVP or about your product? Yeah. So who, anybody want to ask something? Nope. Okay. I have more stories. Um, <laughs> I have another, okay, so I have a few more story, interesting stories to tell you. Uh, one is uh, about marketplaces. So uh, how many of you are building marketplaces? Okay, marketplaces. I was, but I You are, okay. Um, so one of the interesting things about marketplaces is how do you get, how do you get it going, right? Because you have, uh, you have two, two sides of, uh, of the, the chicken and egg problem. So the way that I did it, and I think the common way to do it, like sort of a best practice, is um, that you, you have to narrow the, um, the initial market a lot. So you limit it to one city or only one kind of thing. Okay, so you say, for example, this marketplace, I launched it only in Tel Aviv, which is one city, and only with furniture, which is sort of one um, vertical. And then you, you limit it so much that you can take care of the supply side, like the, the initial sellers, uh, just through your own network, okay? So what I did is, you know, I, I limited to furniture in Tel Aviv, and then I went to all my friends in Tel Aviv, and I forced them to sell their stuff. Like, uh, I, uh, you know, I just walked into their place, I was like, how about this couch, this looks pretty old, <laughs> you know, you should sell it. <laughs> and then they're like, no, I kind of like it, and I was like, no, no, sell it, sell it. Um, so, you know, when, once, once you do that, um, if you narrow the market, if you narrow the initial niche enough, you can fill uh, the supply side by yourself, so that by at launch, it's already there. So when this thing launched, it already had like a hundred things for sale, like in some neighborhoods of Tel Aviv that were furniture. So when I did some marketing that says, do you want some furniture? Like, you know, like it's, it was there. It wasn't like an empty graveyard of, uh, of things. Um, yeah, okay, that's just a story that I wanted to tell. Um, okay, so I think if, unless there, anybody has a question, yeah. Do you have a question, Papa? You want to save me here? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you can talk, can you talk a little about uh, how do you negotiate or talk with VCs 
to ask for funding when you need or for, with angel investors? I think this is a, mm -hmm. a question many startups has and you sure. have a lot of experience okay. with that. No problem. So uh, I need to sort of start by saying that my opinions about VC are, are um, not... I mean, they're not like super radical, but they're not exactly the common um, sort of opinion. So I've never raised money. I've, like, I'm on my third company right now without raising money. Um, so that they're all self-funded. But, uh, of course, a lot of you will want to raise money. And so the first thing I would recommend is to really think if you really need it. Because uh, raising money, like it, especially if you're just starting out, it's, it usually seems like it's a pure win. Like, of course, you know, somebody wants to give me money, I'll take it. <laughs> you know? uh, but it actually has some downsides, too. Um, it generally makes you less flexible and accountable uh, to other parties who may or may not, you know, share your vision, you know, and like I've heard enough stories at this point of people like not having good relationship with their VC, so that happens. Um, there's also something about raising money which uh, sort of gives you like longer times where you can be not productive. So. Uh, sort of the realities of business are if you don't have funding that, you know, maybe you'll stop after half a year, but if you have funding, maybe you'll stop only after three years, so you can waste more of your time. Uh, but now, if you do want to raise money, um, look, investor, you know, investors are rational people, okay? You need to make a case for why uh, investing in your startup is a good idea. Usually the things that matter are um, uh, market vision, so you gotta, you got to tell them why the market that you're uh, in is a good market, like why people need your product. You want to show, you want to show traction. Traction matters a lot. Like, you know, just show this is working. Customers are buying this, you know, sort of people need this. So, for example, one of my friends uh, raised uh, um, his first round by actually selling the product uh, to people with cash, like, you know, like a prototype. He built like a prototype and, and just sold it to people. <laughs> like for cash and then he took photos of all the people giving him like cash and then he went to the VCs and like here people paying me for my product okay people want this and it worked you know um, so if you can demonstrate demand uh, that's always very strong so there's a saying in raising money which goes traction trumps everything so no matter you know what else a, uh, an investor might think if you can show that you're growing and that people want it then that always matters more than everything else um, uh, Papo, do you want me to like say anything else specific about raising yeah. money? Yeah. Uh, so one another question is, uh, if you don't raise or you don't want to raise money with VCs, how you bootstrap your startup? How how you are, how you deal with that? And that's a good question. With your your experience about that. Right. Uh, good question. So um, the first thing is to choose the right kind of startup to build. Okay. There are startups which just don't work without VC funding. Okay. So things that that require huge scale. Uh, you know, where you need millions of users to be relevant or where you make very little money per person. So in, in the business of startups, there's, a, there's a, uh, a term called CLV, customer lifetime value, also sometimes called ARPU, like average revenue per user, um, which basically is like how much money do you expect to make per person interacting or using your system. So um, that's a very important metric. It, it influences a lot of things. So, for example, social sites usually have very low average revenue per user. So, you know, Facebook has billions of, you know, like, you know, a billion users and they make like a billion or a few billion dollars. So they make about like a dollar or two or three per person per year. Now, uh, there's companies that sell, let's say, business software, like, you know, at the, at the other end, like if you're IBM, you're building a contract where one client pays you $10 million. Okay, so there's a range of uh, how much money you can expect to make per client or per user. Now... Um, if you do something where that number is very low, it means that you have, need to have huge scales and uh, you're going to have to raise money, okay? So uh, if you do things where people pay you money, like for example, mixed sales, you know, which are sold and, you know, I make a few hundred dollars per customer over their lifetime, um, it, it, it allows itself for a, a bootstrapping process, like Papa said, so you can actually launch it, make some money, put it back in the company, you know, what some people might call a real business, you know? <laughs> um, uh, so, so one, one thing that you do is, is if you don't want to raise money, you pick the right problem. So you don't try to go after the huge scale things. You go after things which you can, you know, sell. Uh, does that answer your question, Papo? Yeah. Um, anything else you want to ask? Or anybody else? Nope. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs>